Um, so basically, like Zainab has said, we've been working, uh, HasGeek and Privacy Mode has been working towards understanding the effect of the IT rules among the tech community um, over the last um, last two months. And from and we have been conducting FGDs and interviews with, you know, members of legal po and policy teams of uh, different tech communities we've also talked to public interest technologists we've um, spoken to startup founders CISOs and security tech teams as well and what we what we've collated so far is merely an understanding about how does this work on the ground uh, how will how are companies planning on responding to the IT rules and more importantly what are problems they see or they envision as of now so uh, broadly speaking what we've currently found is that there is large aspects of compliance that requires maybe a little more discussion which of course Udbhav will definitely uh, you know take part in um, and expand more on the legal aspects but uh, some things that we'd like to point out is the um, difficulty of the personal liability clauses that are uh, enforced in the IT rules, predominantly with your chief compliance officer. Uh, another aspect that you know we've uh, we found to be highly uh, uh, confusing with regards to compliance is the aspect of periodic reporting. Um, the IT rules mandates that any organization must report on all the grievances uh, and send and submit it to an authority during a periodic period of time. Um, but nevertheless, there is no clarity on what a rep what such a report should entail, um, what the format of such a report is, and what they mean by periodic intervals. So these are aspects that you know members of the community were worried about. Another aspect that uh, that um, we are going to talk that we are speaking about is with regards to takedown notification and data retention and data deletion practices. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know grievance redressal mechanism is an in important part of this legislation. So what happens is um, the uh, institution has a period of about thirty six hours and uh, 72 uh, 36 hours to remove any content that is seen as uh, questionable or has been uh, highlighted as a grievance when such a situation occurs uh, you know is that period of time feasible for a lot of these entities also take into consideration we don't know the volume of grievances right that come in the in in that period of time and then after that Another huge aspect of this uh, legislation that uh, you know individuals are worried about is with regards to privacy. So there is a clause known as the first originator clause in, in the legislation that requires one to track down who the first originator of any type of questionable content uh, you know whoever was create who is the first indian who has created this type of any type of questionable content which means um to what degrees of privacy are we talking about um you know how far is that clause willing to remove encryption practices is also something that we've we've discussed um how this might even affect freedom of speech is another aspect we've discussed and um, these are some points that we've spoken about and i think uh, a last point that we would want to talk about is the oversight monitoring that is currently uh, seen um, a lot of organizations do not know who enforces the rules they know that they can uh, that Métis does contact them with regards to grievance redressal issues but who do they contact when issue when there are problems is when grievances are not resolved and in a specific way or format. So these are the large uh, sort of brackets that we've observed when we've been doing our FGDs uh, with, rega uh, with regards to this law. Um, you know, and in the recent past, we've also seen 
many large you know uh, tech entities also you know um, file public hearings and writ petitions in courts you know we see digital pub publications like news minute the wire um, and the quint who have filed cases in the delhi high court we've also seen um, google as well as whatsapp also file cases with regards to the it rules as well in the delhi high court so uh, without uh, further ado i guess uh, we can um, speak to uh, udbhav uh, udbhav are you there hi bhavani thank you so much uh, yeah hi everyone so udbhav yeah sorry go ahead Sure, Bhavani. You know, please feel free. Like I, uh, I'm happy to like for you to introduce myself, but also just to spend 15 seconds talking about what I do. Is that alright? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No problem. Sure. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I uh, am Udhav Kavari. I'm uh, Mozilla's public policy advisor for the Asia Pacific region. I'm based in New Delhi in India, and over the last two years, for Mozilla, I've been working on various issues that impact the open internet, such as data governance, intermediary liability, uh, content moderation, and encryption. Uh, connectivity. Um, I thought that over the course of the next, like maybe fifteen to twenty minutes before we sort of really move on to questions, I would broadly try to do four things. The first is give uh, y'all a high level overview of what intermediary liability is, some of the global sort of history and its Indian context and how it's developed over the last couple of years, uh, largely in the interest of showcasing how. The legal regime that governs intermediary liability in India has evolved as well, but using real world examples and not really getting into laws or things like that. Um, then covering why intermediary liability is important, what are the different ways in which it has allowed the internet to grow and develop uh, fundamentally in the way that it has. Thirdly, talk a little bit about the rules and like talk about some of the sort of like high level provisions within the rules, and what sort of impact they can have on the internet, and then finally have a sort of dedicated section that like can answer any questions. Like you all may have as well. In case you are in front of a computer or would like to sort of like have something to read along while I'm talking or as late, like uh, in the chat, in the Zoom chat, I've also just shared a link to a blog post that Mozilla has put out about this that sort of contains a high level summary and uh, like post the talk. We can also sort of leave it as a comment in the YouTube channel as well. Or, or just Googling Mozilla Open Internet India should sort of like bring this up as one of the results. So having said all of that, I think uh, first we'd like to start off with what is intermediary liability, right? It sounds like a very like legalistic word that, that seems to say complicated things, but at a fundamental basis, it simply means that platforms, no matter what that platform is, and everything from Google search to Amazon Web Services to a blog that you host to the chat that runs on Zomato are all intermediaries. And intermediaries are essentially entities that allow for content to be sent or, or like communicated on their platforms um, across either two users or multiple users uh, and sometimes not even just users but like machine to machine communication as well and intermediary liability is the idea that these platforms should not be liable for the content that is on them unless they are specifically required to uh, unless they specifically know that there is something going on on their platforms after which if they don't act upon it once the government tells them that their content is illegal, then they will become liable for it. At its simplest level, it means that if I say send uh, Zenab uh, a, a text message that is considered seditious under Indian law, then the platform will not be liable for said sedition until somebody tells the platform that that message that has been sent across is illegal under Indian law. Here is a government agency or a court saying that it is illegal, and therefore you should prevent it from being sent on your platform. After that point in time, if the platform either not, uh, com completely ignores the request or doesn't act in the way that the law requires it to do, after that point, like the step platform can be held liable for that content being on the platform. The similar law apply, like similar frameworks apply to hate speech online, extremist content online, um, uh, C sandwiches, child sexual abuse materials online, and a wide variety of content uh, on the internet. Fundamentally speaking, this is also called safe hub, which is that you as a platform or as an intermediary are safe from liability as long as you don't ignore the fact that you are informed about content being illegal and refuse to act upon that content being illegal. 
uh, I, like having explained that at a high level, how does it really operate in practice, right? And I think in order to understand intermediate viability, there are two important things that one needs to know. The first is this law in America called the Communication Decency Act. Uh, now, the Communication Decency Act, the CDA, is an act that uh, many people call specifically Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act as the fundamental basis upon which the internet has grown and developed in the way it has. And what the Communications Decency Act essentially says is that platforms are free or intermediaries are free to regulate or edit the content on their platforms without being held liable for it in any way. And the history behind this is that there were lots of conversations when the internet was sort of really kicking off between like in the early 19 and mid 1990s in America that platforms will start being held liable for allowing certain speech on their platforms and not allowing certain speech on their platforms, whether this was excessive reviews, whether there was trolling, or whether it was otherwise illegal content, people started saying that unless platforms are given some sort of a protection against the idea, that if they act upon a piece of content, they will be protected from liability against it, then they will be forced to either take down too much content or do over censorship, something that I will talk about in a bit, or um, alternatively, shall simply allow all sorts of content to simply be on that platform, which will not be good for users and society in general, which is what led to the first so-called intermediary liability law in America called the Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. And you may have also seen in news and like in, in general, in like public discourse, the idea that even in America, there are many conversations around how Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act should be amended so that it can uh, now be like reformed to account for the new ways in which platforms have and the power that they fundamentally enjoy in society activities like the deplatforming of uh, President Donald Trump in uh, the United States of America is also another instance that has sparked that debate. Now, why is all of this relevant in India? So India didn't actually have an intermediary liability law until some time, uh, like the, until the IT Act was amended in 2008. Uh, and when new rules around them was also passed in 2011. And the history behind why India did not have an intermediary liability law until that point in time and why we did have one after that, I think is very interesting and really helps uh, underscore the importance of why India needs intermediary liability. Uh, at that point in time, uh, there was a website, some, which I'm sure some of you all are aware of, called Bazi.com. That was sort of like an eBay, but for India, where you could bid on products on the internet and uh, depend on the highest bidder could actually get that product sort of like either physically shipped to them or delivered to them. A very typical sort of like e-commerce model. Um, at that point in time, uh, there was a sexually explicit video uh, that was circulating around the internet and somebody had put up a copy of that video up for sale on Bazi.com and had said that this is going to be on sale uh, and the CD would be sent to the person who wins the bid. And, and what happened at that point in time was that the police actually arrested the CEO of Bazi.com saying that Bazi.com was playing a role in the propagation of pornographic content in India, which is illegal. Um, and at that time, there was widespread outrage in the industry because people said that Bazi.com did not have the ability to monitor each and every piece of content that users put onto its platform for sale and the fact uh, and monitor who it was being sold to. They agreed that they took the listing down immediately uh, when they were informed of this. But because India didn't have an intermediary liability regime, the head of Bazi.com was actually had to spend many years in courts trying to prove himself innocent by saying that this is how online platforms work at the scale at which they operate. It's impossible to hold individuals uh, liable for the action for illegal content being put by users on a platform. And in general, that is something that the Indian government agreed to. And that's why India has an intermediary liability regime, because uh, without it and without safe harbor, it is remarkably easy to penalize individuals for content that they had nothing to do with and that they even take down when it was illegal. But until they take it down, any harm that occurs in society because of it is something that they are not liable for, which is what India's intermediary liability regime has now said for a fair bit of time. With all of this context, I'd now like to move on to the second issue, which is why is intermediary liability important? So what India's intermediary liability regime does is it actually creates due diligence obligations for intermediaries to enjoy safe harbor. So what it says is, if you are an intermediary, you have safe harbor. And I'm going to get into what are the different kinds of intermediaries, active intermediaries and passive intermediaries in a bit. But it says in order for you to enjoy safe harbor, you need to have and follow certain steps 
And those steps are steps that can involve a wide variety of obligations that unless you follow, you will not enjoy safe harbor. Uh, examples of things that were part of the previous steps that were present under Indian law was that there is a government committee under six, section 69A of the IT Act, which is sort of outside the purview of like this immediate discussion, but essentially that's the government committee that tells um, uh, platforms to take content down after evaluating content. If that committee tells you that this con piece of content should be taken down, then you have to take it down. And if you don't take it down, you don't enjoy safe harbor for that particular piece of content. Similarly, uh, there are uh, other provisions that platforms would have to share data uh, if law enforcement agencies made a demand for that information too, which is actually present in the latest 2020 draft. Uh, and there are many such other obligations that are present in uh, the intermediate liability framework that were the due diligence obligations that platforms needed to comply with. So if you only if you follow those due diligence obligations, do you enjoy safe harbor? If it can be proven you did not follow them, you do not enjoy safe harbor and therefore could be held liable for that piece of content. Uh, given the technology sector in India, you can certainly imagine that like every startup that involves an interaction between two entities or multiple groups of entities in some form or the other is an intermediary. The chat function inside Danzo and Zomato is an intermediary. An IRC server that you or I may run is an intermediary. A chat server that we may run on Discord is also at the end of the day an intermediary. Uh, and the broader scope of intermediary is so wide. There have other laws and regulations in the world that actually explicitly split up intermediaries and call them and, there are, and provide different obligations for different kinds of intermediaries. For example, there is something called the e-commerce directive in the European Union. And what the e-commerce directive specifically says is that uh, there are different categories of intermediaries that carry out different functions. For example, telecommunications providers, right? Imagine you are on a phone call and you are currently plotting uh, uh, a murder that you are going to carry out with three of your accomplices day after tomorrow at this particular location. Now, just imagine if somebody held your, say, service provider, hypothetically an Airtel or a Reliance Geo, liable for the fact that it is a party or an accessory to carrying out that murder because that conversation took place on their network or took place on a phone call that was run through the Airtel network. That seems like a pretty ridiculous idea, right? And then that's something that like equally applies to so many ideas on the internet as well. So keeping this in mind, the e-commerce directive says that if you're a telecom services provider, then these are the obligations that you have to carry out to a well safe harbor. If you are a platform that sells services or provides services, then these are the obligations you have to carry out. If you're a communication platform, then these are the services you have to get. Um, and like all of these categories have different levels of obligations in them. The reason I mention all of this is that India's regime does not have any of this sort of subclassification the way that I've described. And because of that, uh, there are many issues that sort of start to arise. The first is that unless an intermediary really enjoys safe harbor, it's very, very easy for them to comply with any request that entities ask them to take down content because of the fear that they will end up losing their liability because of it. And there's a very interesting example that I'd like to give uh, specifically about how over-censorship and intermediary liability works. So there is a very sort of important case under Indian law called Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India, uh, which is something that uh, is also linked in the blog post that I've shared in chat. But also otherwise, just Googling Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India will bring will you many useful summaries. You don't necessarily have to read the whole judgment. But what those rules did was before the judgment came out in, I believe it was 2015, the, what the, like, there were three entities that could ask platforms to take content down. The government could, the court could, and finally, any user. Which means that if you and I got into an argument on a Facebook, say, post thread, and if you thought that I defamed you, you could just write a notice to Facebook saying, this person has defamed me, take this piece of content down. And there was an appellate mechanism, but essentially anybody could report any content they, that they discovered to the platforms. And that was considered notice to the platform for that content being illegal. As you can imagine, people used to send thousands of things that sometimes we just used to annoy them. Uh, and there is this research institution in Bangalore and with, with an office in New Delhi as well, called the Center for Internet and Society that did a fantastic piece of research around this um, around 2012. But where, what they found out was that 
they essentially did a sting operation, which is that they sent over a hundred approximately fake takedown requests, which is content that was perfectly legal, but they just claimed that it was illegal to different internet service providers and asked them to either take the piece of content down or to block that content from being served on platforms. And the vast majority of that content, despite it completely being legal, was blocked by those internet service providers. What that showcased, and this is something the Supreme Court actually used and cited in the Shreya's judgment, is that if you create an obligation where unless you comply with the request that somebody who is authorized by law is giving you, then people, in order to be legally safe, will simply comply with that request and will not do the due diligence that they are required to actually determine whether that content is legal or illegal. And because of that, uh, like report and the research around this, the Supreme Court actually struck down that part. They said that users cannot report to platforms that content is illegal for it to mandatorily be taken down. Platforms will have the notice for a piece of content being illegal only when either a court or a government agency does. And now, as you can imagine, with this entire sort of like framing, uh, the due diligence obligations that could cover intermediary liabilities pre like essentially prevent over censorship, they prevent, um, uh, they allow platforms to sustainably scale and grow. Uh, and they also ensure that in general ideas like the freedom of expression, privacy and security are things that platforms can continue to build features for as long as they aren't held liable for that. Because imagine I am what's happened, the year is 2013 and I'm deciding I am going to build end-to-end -end encryption and make it mandatory available for everyone. Or imagine I'm Signal or any other messaging application that you trust that actually has good end-to-end -end encryption. And suddenly I like there is a law that says if you enable, if you do not have the ability to block content that the government says you should like block, then you may be liable under Indian law for that piece of content. Now, as you can imagine, that's something that may actually make you think twice before implementing features like encryption, right? So the, not only can intermediary, like having bad safe harbor laws can not just have impacts on users, but can also have very tangible impacts on companies, right? both from feature development as well as like Bhavani just spoke about earlier, also many problems with how like compliance and sort of the uh, financial burden that it can impose upon companies, especially those that are smaller. So those are some of the reasons that like why intermediary liability uh, is fundamentally important. Right? And, I, and I hope that like in this broader context, we've like, I've explained to you the different kinds of intermediaries that are like TSPs, which is more like, you know, like a dump pipes, as well as like active in, like intermediaries that allow for active communication, such as like hosting a YouTube video or, or, or hosting a blog, as well as like other places where intermediaries also exist, right? Like I think for this audience that I'm speaking to, GitHub is an intermediary because GitHub is allowing you to store code on the internet that anyone else can view and do things with if you choose to sort of share it that way, right? And the same thing applies to IRC chat rooms, mailing lists, Discord servers, Slack groups, all of these, in all of these instances, those platforms that are providing this service is are intermediaries and, and therefore are bound by these rules and these regulations. So having explained all of that, I thought I'll now just very quickly go into like, what are some of the main ways in which uh, intermediary liability uh, like is evolving in India? And then what are some of the big challenges there, right? Like I would say that the first thing that the rules have done, and this is something I've mentioned in the past, is that they've created this new framework. And that framework says that for intermediary liability, there are going to be two categories of intermediaries. They're going to be social, like they're going to be significant social media intermediaries and all other intermediaries. Right? And the thing is that there are a set of obligations that apply to all intermediaries. And then there are a set of very onerous obligations that apply to social, significant social media intermediaries. Uh, there aren't any special obligations that apply only to social media intermediaries, even though that is some, like, that's a term that's actually used in the rules a couple of times. Now, the reason this distinction is very important is that like some of the worst changes in the rules only apply to significant social media intermediaries. Now, significant social media intermediaries are those intermediaries that have over 5 million or 50 lakh users uh, in a year. What is a user? Is it a daily active user? Is it a monthly active user? None of those things are really clearly def are defined at all in the rules. And the government has the ability to notify a platform that it believes otherwise should be a social significant social media intermediary into one as well. And once you become a social media intermediary, you're, you're supposed to have local compliance officers, right? Like, so as you can imagine, do more than 50 lakh people in India use Slack or do more than 50 lakh people in India use services like Discord, right? Um, um, and, and you can imagine like 
they probably do like across all the different services so everything that i'm saying right now most people only talk about how google has to comply with it or facebook has to comply with it or twitter has to comply with it all of which is true but they also much much smaller companies that are used in a far more diverse they also actually have to continue to comply with these rules and that's something that i think many of us like quite often forget and uh, this what are some of the things that these significant social media intermediaries have to do right like the first is you have to enable traceability of encrypted messages which means that you have to be able to say the government will give you a message say this is the piece of text this is an image and you have to tell it when was the first time this message was sent in the country what that means is it doesn't matter if it's a forward it doesn't matter if it's been copy pasted to people all they want to know is the first time this message was sent in the country and as what which has challenged these rules in court said that will essentially require for end to end encrypted messages a hash of every piece of content that is sent on that platform to be stored associated with the user who is sending it each and every time it has been sent and as you, as you can imagine that's very very scary as an idea both in terms of the harm that it possibly causes but also the privacy and security risks that it creates the other things that they are required to do is that they are supposed to endeavor to use automated filtering they are supposed to ensure that if there is particular pieces of content that is being paid for or promoted by people then the platform needs to label it um, and then there are also a bunch of obligations that are applied on entities that are all in all intermediaries right so both significant social media intermediaries but also all other intermediaries so technically everything that i've said to you about like telecom service providers stack discord also have to do a bunch of other things uh, alongside any intermediary even if you just have like two users so you could set up a blog tomorrow uh, and you could host it on your own server and you would technically be an intermediary that would be required to comply with some of these provisions not the provisions around significant social media intermediaries but the smaller ones now what are those provisions uh, and they're not really small at all right? like the first is that if the government asks you to take a piece of content down you are mandatorily supposed to do within a period of 48 hours second if a government tells you that they want information of users on your platform for law enforcement agencies or for other purposes you are supposed to provide that mandatorily in 72 hours um and a bunch of other obligations around what sort of content you can and cannot allow on your platform one of the things that are present in the 2021 rules of the kind of content that platform should prohibit on their platforms is information that is patently false as you can imagine it's a very very big term and who determines what is patently true or patently false information or given the world in which we live in is something that i think we should all really think about and consider and whether we want the government to be able to require pieces of content to necessarily be taken down because they are patently false whether the government determines whether it's patently true or patently false because that's how it would work under the current sort of regime um, and the final thing that i haven't really like gotten into yet is that on uh, like there is there are also elements of like legal and personal liability in these rules and what that means is that if you don't comply with them very similar to the story that i told you earlier about bazi.com and why india has an intermediary liability regime people can be held liable and for significant social media intermediaries like they have to have grievance officers and it's possible that in case can be issued like issued against those individuals who are supposed to coordinate with law enforcement agencies but even for all other intermediaries it's very possible for the government to do exactly what it did with bazi.com just by saying that this is a piece of content that you haven't taken down in 48 hours and it's very it's a very commonly used argument that, that why why shouldn't they be harsh obligations to take on harmful content on the internet it's anyways so much of it is on the internet and it's causing so much of it harm but the true answer to that is that making that content making platforms liable for taking down that content is not going to prevent illegal content from being on the internet the only thing it's really going to do is disincentivize innovation place entities in these platforms at risk and just ensure that these rules are used to like selectively harass either certain platforms or certain individuals because the problem of online harms and online harm content is not that of it not being taken down but of like digital literacy and far other bigger deeper issues that don't really uh, like aren't really accounted for in these rules at all in any real way so with that like uh, i'm not going to get get into some of the other provisions like making content filtering like the, everything around digital media regulation which as uh, bhavani mentioned earlier have been challenged in courts but in general like this these are a high set of high level like overview of why intermediary liability is important and what are some of the things that are deeply problematic in the intermediary liability rules 
uh, and like in in the final sort of like five minutes, I guess, of my individual talk before we really get into questions, I'd like to also very quickly talk about like what is the current legal status of these like IT rules, right? And what's happened there is that these rules are now law. Uh, they were first passed in late December, and then platforms got three months to be able to comply with them. Uh, and then what ended up? Thanks, Anna. I'll try to speak a little slower and uh, hope that like y'all can hear me. If it doesn't work, please let me know. I'll just turn my video down so that my order, audio uh, is clearer. Uh, so what did the like? So essentially, these are now law, uh, and because they are now law, platforms are technically required to comply with them today. As you can imagine, I like there are so many examples that we can instinctively come up with on things like traceability, event-to-end encrypted messages, and automated filtering that so many platforms that we know about don't necessarily do. So it's a, it's a open question as to how these rules will necessarily be enforced, but at the risk of non-compliance is very, very strong. And that's something that I think we should all necessarily keep um, in mind. So what and what like groups all over the country have essentially done is that A, uh, entities like Hasgeek as well as so many other entities are really working towards spreading the word on these rules, telling people what are the ways in which like uh, they are bad, what are the ways in which they can be improved, what are some of the different changes that the government could do with regard to how these rules are enforced to minimize some of these harms while still allowing the government to meet some of its legitimate uh, like objectives behind limiting harmful content. Uh, but I think there are also a separate set of people who really decided that um, because of the way that the rules have now already become law, they need to be challenged in courts. So there what's happened is that I would say that the challenges around the digital media part of these rules, something that we haven't really spoken about, but um, these rules also give the central government the power to be able to take down a single piece of news content on an online platform or to ask an online news platform to amend a particular piece of news content. Something that, as you can imagine, um, even in print publications, like is very, very hard to do, but it's much easier to do that here. Um, for online news content. And because of the sort of vast proliferation of online news content, the registration requirements that these rules contain, the fact that the government can ask you to censor particular pieces of content in a, in a government committee, right? This committee doesn't have a judge. It doesn't have external experts. There are some sort of like self-regulatory mechanisms, but in an emergency, a government committee full of executive members can order for, for certain pieces of news content to either be taken down or to be amended as an example. So those are the parts that have actually been challenged more actively in courts all around the world, or sorry, all around the country where um, there have been challenges in Karnataka, Kerala, and a bunch of other places. And I think the uh, challenge in Karnataka and in the Delhi High Court, and the challenge in Kerala in particular has been quite successful where live law has actually managed to get uh, an order that says that though that part of the rules will not only apply to live law or legal news publication, um, until like that case uh, is essentially settled. But in general, there are also some challenges that organizations like the Internet Freedom Foundation have made themselves a part of and have um, participated in like across the country, both helping allies, but also actively sort of like being parties in some of the cases as well. But I would say that all of these are at like very, very early stages. The, similar to uh, this, there are there's also a challenge by WhatsApp that has specifically challenged the traceability provisions in the intermediary liability rules as well in the Delhi High Court. Um, and they have a blog post uh, that if you just Google WhatsApp traceability FAQ on, on the internet, you should be able to get the link that they explain why they've done so and like why they think traceability is a problem. But as, as we saw last time, for example, if you, like, if you remember, I told you about the Bazi case and I told you about Shreya Single, all of these cases took years to play out, at least two to three years to play out, which means that these rules, if they all, if the, all of them in their entirety have come into force in May 2021, I would say those are the sort of timelines we should keep in mind before courts will actively be able to make a difference as to how these legislations broadly operate. So because of that, I think what we ultimately like uh, need to keep in mind is that like these rules are law, uh, platforms are required to comply with them. Uh, there are some good parts in those rules, such as the provisions that say that like if you do automated filtering, you need to account for like uh, bias and discrimination in those algorithms, such as the fact that if a platform voluntarily takes content down to enforce its community guidelines or the law, actually it's just the law, not community guidelines, then they enjoy something called a good Samaritan protection, which is that if an intermediary is not supposed to exercise editorial control over its content, then it, just because it voluntarily takes down content that is otherwise illegal under Indian law doesn't mean it will not be an intermediary anymore. So there are some good things and changes in these rules, but the vast majority of them um, are very worrisome, both for privacy and security, as well as for like the average small startup that just wants to like 
operate either a consumer or a business to sort of business phase, uh, facing like entity uh, that will definitely increase the sort of like compliance burdens that they will have to fulfill, but also put them uh, at risk of, of legal pressure in a way that will make it very hard for them to operate uh, in this space. So having covered sort of all of this, I, I would just like to end by saying this is definitely a very pressing issue. It's, it, there are many organizations uh, like I've mentioned in, in this conversation, like the Internet Freedom Foundation, like the Center for Internet and Society, um, uh, and others all over the country that are working on this issue. And please do visit their websites like to understand the issue better, spread the word about them because of how fundamental they are to ensuring that the internet can remain uh, 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 an open space. And with that, I'll like now hand, back, hand it back to Bhavani and Zainab for any questions that may like come up or anything else that I can help with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Udbhav. That was very exhaustive in the explanation and covered a lot of points. So now we'd like to open up the uh, open up the chats for any questions that you guys might have for Hasgeek or for uh, Udbhav as well. Um, you can definitely um, send your questions via chat or you or uh, via the YouTube link as well. So those are two options. Um, so while we wait, I was kind of uh, wondering, Udbhav, um, as of right now, um, you spoke at the end about a bunch of court uh, writ petitions against the IT rules, right? And as far as I can tell, there are majorly two main types of players that are currently there. You have digital publications who are extensively petitioning in, uh, like you said, Kerala, Karnataka, and Delhi. And then in addition to that, you also have uh, larger intermediaries like Google and WhatsApp who've also filed cases. Um, and one thing I wanted to, like two things I wanted to ask while we're waiting for, you know, everyone to start raising some of their questions. One is, why do you think both these groups have been so vocal about it? And the second thing is, um, with regards to the Google case, I think there's another nuance about the law um, with regards to scope creep that we kind of uh, could expand upon. Because I think as far as I can tell, that mm -hmm. case was basically uh, that case is basically where Google is fighting to not be under the IT rules because it is a search engine and shouldn't be governed the same way as a social media intermediary. So maybe you could expand on this while, you know, we're waiting for some questions to come. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think that like, um, that's just one example of so Google case that you described in the scope creep is just one example of why there are many aspects of these rules which are suffering from like definitional ambiguity, right? Unless you define terms very clearly and concisely, it's, it's possible to subjectively impose them upon certain kinds of entities and certain kinds of obligations. Um, and because of that, I would say that like what Google is trying to say is that its search engine is not a social media entity. And uh, in like, and that process is going to play through in courts. But I can assure you that from the definition of what a social media intermediary is, there are many other entities that may be thought of as social media ent entities, but aren't social media entities that won't necessarily have the resources or the wherewithal of Google to be able to necessarily find them out. Of. So I think that like this approach of like trying to fight a case that is just for yourself, so that your particular like product or outlook is excluded from a purview of the rules. Uh, is something that like is not really scope creep, but like is definitely definitional ambiguity by design, right? Like if a definition is broad and vague, anyone can subjectively choose to impose it against entities in any way that they really want, and that's what platforms are really fighting against. But I think in the long term, the sustainable solution to this is really taking it to like courts and Supreme Court in a principal level where you don't argue like the various very important. It's not like it's unimportant like sub issues of implementation, but like fix the problem of the fact that the intermediary liability provision under the Indian IT Act simply does not empower the government to be able to make rules that are as broad and as vague as this to cover everything from all intermediaries, which the rules, previous rules did, but also all digital news content, which many people are contending that it does not. Uh, the argument that is being made is that if these rules have to do the things they do, there needs to be a new act. It needs to pass the Indian parliament. And then after that, it will become rules. Uh, the Morning Context uh, publication actually did a really nice story uh, that I think came out just yesterday, actually, that actually showed how they uh, got RTI documentation that showcased uh, the Ministry of IMB, 
uh, and and the intelligence bureau and a bunch of other people also said that if such content has to be regulated, it's better to pass a law to do so rather than ju- just do so under the rules. So I think like we need to keep that broader framing and context in mind. And that while those debates are important, like the solution lies in fixing it for everyone and not just the few powerful companies. Sure, thanks. Um, Udbhav, since we're anyway in uh, a meeting to explain the legislation to the developer community as what Phi Delhi is uh, a part of, maybe could you uh, expand on what you, how you think this community might be affected by the IT rules? You gave a very broad sort of in-depth explanation about individual rights and you know overarching um, business issues. But as an individual in, in the developer community, do you think there are things that people might should be worried about and should be thinking about? Uh, I mean, I think that like there are some sort of immediately obvious ones that I believe I mentioned in the conversation as well. Things like code being hosted on GitHub, or things like chat rooms that uh, like developers may run on Discord and Slack and uh, like IRC servers that they or like other entities may host. All of these things are things that fall within the purview of intermediary liability and these rules. And what that will essentially mean is that A, developers will have to be a lot more careful about what they say in such platforms, um, especially if it may have the possibility of running afoul of government laws and regulations. But secondly, they will also have to be careful about what platforms they choose, right? Because one could argue that if a foreign-based platform provides these services in India but doesn't necessarily comply with the entirety of these rules, uh, then it's very, very hard to imagine how uh, like the foreign platform will be allowed to continue providing that service in India. So something that I think all of like everybody on like hope the Zoom channel, like Zoom, sorry, conversation probably has a signal account, right? And the Indian government has already started signaling that signaling that signal is not uh, complying with India's intermediate liability rules. And if that escalates and it goes down the way it does, it's very possible an app like Signal may be blocked. Right. So at a basic level, there are the issues that like the actions that developers are already used to carrying out via the internet, they will have to be much more careful about that content may be censored and taken down much more easily. Uh, and in general, I would say there is also the compliance aspect of it that is as it's actually a developer issue. Like it's like most startups are actually founded by or young technology companies are founded by developers. So the amount of sort of obligations that they will have to like uh, you like uh, and the amount of money that they will have to influence to be able to implement these rules is massive. And because of that, one has to keep in mind that it's very very hard to imagine uh, how they will be able to uh, to do so. Uh, in the same way that they've done in the recent past uh, before these rules and when necessarily coming to force. So I think it will also impact innovation and other things that developers may be able to do as well. Uh, someone has raised the question, uh, how does the use of Tor services get impl- impacted by these rules? Uh, technically speaking, the Tor like service, anybody who hosts a Tor service is I would say an intermediary, depending on like, and this these, these are publicly available numbers, but depending on how many individuals in India use Tor, social media, Tor sort of services, it's very easy to imagine Tor being a significant sort of like uh, social media intermediary as well, depending on how the government chooses to define that term and if they choose to enforce against it, right? Uh, I think it's quite obvious that like Tor is a service that is built and designed to overcome government censorship. Uh, for example, if like, China can pass a law that says Tor should not follow certain things in a certain way. The Tor service is not going to change its features to comply with Chinese law. It's just simply like exist and keep existing the way it already does. And I think because of that, uh, if the Indian government really decides to go after Tor or to say that Tor is not complying with Indian laws and regulations and therefore Tor has to be banned in India, uh, then I think they are certainly empowered under these rules to be able to do so. Whether they will do so is another question. Uh, we haven't seen such broad-based blocks in the in the past uh, like ways as well. So I think like one has to really think through what are the different uh, ways in which platforms can resist these government requests. To what exists will they change their future features to be able to comply with these rules too? Because uh, some of them may choose to prioritize the privacy and security of their users, and if the government decides to do something about it, those services may be blocked. Very similar to say Signal or to Tor. Um, I think there was a follow-up question to that where the individual said, but there is no way to track who runs the Tor service. Uh, 
um so yeah so i mean in practice what ends up happening is that like the, there are ways for example that countries like iran and china like actively degrade power services there are ways to overcome them by running like using bridges and, and running like and accessing certain nodes that are privately like uh, you know like hosted and things like that so it's very much a cat and mouse game i agree completely that it's impossible to completely block power in india but there is also for example a publicly available list of fraud nodes with their ip addresses that one can connect and if some of those ip addresses are hidden in india then like after some investigation it's not impossible for the government to go so sort of, like knocking down on somebody's say that here is evidence we have that you are running a power server and uh, therefore and therefore we would like to do something to you because of it right so uh, it is definitely a cat and mouse game there is a lot of back and forth but like whether the government chooses to enforce it in a particular way is, is what will determine how much the rules will impact the these things in practice I'm sorry, Bhavani. I think you're on mute. Hi. Sorry. So somebody else had another question where they're asking, how are strategies to deal with the rules different for content and social or social media platforms versus transaction intermediaries like payment portals, etc. Uh, I would say that like payment portals in general tend to have a lot of onerous obligation that applies to them anyway, like. Uh, like guidelines by reserve bank of india criteria and best practices that are enforced by like banks uh, that they deal with standards like pci dss so i think that like the risk for payment portals is much lower uh, largely because payment portals usually take payment information and pass that on at home and very rarely are used to actively utilize like content in a particular way uh, where you know you don't express your thoughts on a payment portal but you can make payments for someone else's thoughts that say may or may not be controversial for example so for uh, like i can't completely imagine a payment portal getting a request if it is an intermediary in the first place which there is an argument to be made under indian law and in financial law that some of them may not be intermediaries because they do know like who the user is they do know where the sort of transaction is going through so they they don't you know they have a lot of visibility into the process that necessarily takes place but uh, like i mean presuming that they are intermediaries i think that it is possible for the government to make a request that says tell me who did these transactions on your platform in the last 72 hours and i think because of the nature of finance like payment portals will be happy to comply banks will be happy to comply and the government will be able to get that piece of information so we anyways in india don't really have too much privacy when it comes to financial transactions in the government so i think the risk of payment portals is certainly present but it's lower than what it would be for other intermediaries um someone uh, else raised a question about tor again and this was with and it can be sort of a broader question which is uh, you know people can always use tor via vpn and this is also something that when we've spoken with other experts in our group discussions has been raised as well that if you are a bad faith actor um you will find loopholes like vpn to sort of enable practices um so in that sense is vpn uh, really something that the government can uh, trace or govern adequately no i mean i think that's the whole point right like uh, i completely agree with the broader thing that like banning good technology uh, will only make it easier for bad people to use it like that's something that i completely believe in and uh, and therefore everything that like people are saying both on youtube and here are true uh, but in practice i would like to say that like the goal of law and regulation should be should not be to for there to be a hundred thousand ways in which people can you know like break the law circumnavigate like navigations those things are always possible and i absolutely agree that it's not going to be like easy for any of these things to completely be but i think there is the larger point that like it will certainly make legitimate users of these technology feel much more unsafe about using them because they will think that they are doing something illegal when they aren't really necessarily doing something illegal right so i think that like no matter what for example like very sophisticated blocking and surveillance regimes in like those in china like those in iran um, exist and like people are able to get around them and are and are able to sort of like access the rest of the world's internet but like not too many people do so because there is an environment of fear and there's an environment of like and there's a chilling effect on what sort of thoughts and expressions you can actively talk about right so because of that i think one needs to keep in mind that the like 
it's it's okay if there are technical means to get around the blocks that are imposed by these rules but like the average user like you know the person who's not as technically adept as many of the people like on this conversation are should not feel threatened by using those technologies right and and the fact that like laws and regulations like this make it very easy for that to happen they make it very easy to verify technology and make legitimate ways to protect your privacy and censorship as something that there's an environment you're about um, this something that must be imposed so i i agree that there are technological solutions to get around all of these things uh, many of them like so intend to use a piece really get bad but that does not mean that these laws and regulations are okay and they and that that should become the base and the standard where you're supposed to require to utilize service tech or to be able to access blocked websites um uh i think sort of piggy backing on that uh with regards to the sort of vilification of tech right um somebody has given an opinion but i sort of want to uh, articulate it as a question they're saying that laws always lag behind tech and who is the user in a mesh network amazon is providing mesh networks through ding and other devices in the us and ubiquitous uh, networking and is here through lot um my my sort of question is uh, you know does this law seem to have any understanding of how tech actually works on the ground and like this person says you know there are complex layers to this and uh, how will it sort of tackle all of these layers no i mean i think that like uh, in the example of amazon and ring like the user in that case uh, is not something that the government really would want to go after right because it's a mesh network like they will simply hypothetically presuming something like amazon ring is made available in india they will simply go to amazon and they will say we got this message from this ip address that we think originated from your network tell us what you can do amazon will either tell them like at what time it happened or any other information they may have about it or they may say we don't have this information and then the government may either be okay with that or will force amazon to make changes to its products so that it starts tracking some of this information right and that back and forth between like technology and law and like how law lags behind technology is very true I, 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 but i think that like coming coming up with good high level principle based regulation that is regularly updated is the only real way to account for that but it's it's not a reason to not either regulate technology at all uh, now neither is it however an excuse to like you know like make very excessive and openly burdensome laws like we have in made, made in india to attempt to regulate technology in a way that doesn't really understand it so there is definitely a principle based law middle ground that like needs to be followed in this case. um we had just one question where uh, somebody on youtube basically asked will it have an impact on adult content i think because you were talking about bazi.com they're probably asking about it but in general you know not just adult content but content in general in india how do you think it will be affected by it i'm i'm ad libbing on top of that question i mean i think that with regard to like adult content in general like the consumption of adult content is not banned in india but like the distribution and the creation of adult content is like banned and regulated in india and because of that it's the same cat and mouse game right like websites get blocked but that the alternative things so like does it increase the possible risk or the compliance obligations around this probably like for example like you know search engines being making links to like adult content available and if there a law comes out that all adult content is illegal in india and therefore you're not supposed to demonstrate like showcase any adult content at all uh, is an example of ways in which it may end up impacting it but like immediately apart from websites being blocked and all of the things that have already been happening in india i don't see legally why it would change anything apart from making it slightly riskier to like operate in the whole space in general in terms of otherwise content availability i think that like we will definitely see over censorship right like the uh, the consequences of not complying with government requests is quite problematic and uh, if you don't comply with government requests to take pieces of content down then like the odds are that like the government will be able to come after you much more effectively and if that ends up happening like your employees may get arrested you may have to pay hefty fines you may be dragged to court and most people would rather take a piece of content down rather than have to deal with all of that trouble so i think that like we're only beginning to see the impact of these rules because they've been enforced like for a month just a little more than a month now the most problematic parts uh, but in in over in the longer term if they stay the way they are i definitely see freedom of expression and like general content availability taking a hit um, in india i think uh, we're getting a lot of questions about traceability 
so could you maybe ex elaborate on the traceability argument and you know how it came about as part of the it rules and i il guidelines and generally like how is it possible to implement traceability yeah i mean i also saw some questions around traceability in ring mesh and things like that and the thing is that the government doesn't really care about whether something is technologically possible or not when it came up with the you know, traceability right like they just want it so if you have a tech piece of technology that doesn't allow for that outcome to exist then you have to change that technology or not utilize that technology uh, which is equally applies to tracing people on mesh networks as an example uh, but also as much and equally applies to things like end to end encryption so at a high level that's the answer the government did not make these laws on the basis of how technology works in practice and what are its pros and cons but by wanting certain outcomes to exist in the first first place <laughs> excuse me so in general i would say that like why are they a part of it rules uh, they are a part of the it rules because the indian government long back in 20 uh, 19 like when there were lots of messages that were going around that apparently excuse me that apparently were causing like uh, like lynchings and because of like rumors of child kidnapping and things like that in you know 2018 2019 uh, said that there were amend intermediary liability rules to like clamp down on those things from happening and what they said was because whatsapp is end to end encrypted like if they ask whatsapp who first sent this message before it went viral whatsapp can't do so and they wanted whatsapp to like give them that answer and that's why they have come up with the traceability provision uh, that they have um so that's that, that's with regard to why it's a part of the it rules uh, in practice however like i would say it it is not possible to implement traceability without either significantly breaking into an encryption or massively increasing like you know user surveillance and visibility so like it's not to say that like it's not possible to do some of the things that traceability may require so for example big companies like google and facebook do scan your email to see whether you have child pornography on it or not um and if you don't um like and if you have it like they block your account and they report you to the police right so uh, but whatsapp for example can't do that for end to end encrypted content but does it in other ways where it looks at what groups you are a part of if you've been reported as users for sharing these kind of content so there are many different ways of dealing with the problem of like you know extremist and sexually abused, like and, and like these kind of content on both normal platforms and end to end encrypted platforms but like what the government in, what the indian government wants which is tracing who sent it first seems impossible to do and like the whatsapp post that explains this like does a fairly or like i think good uh, job of it as well uh, in terms of like if people uh, like i also think that in general what are the implications i see there are some like questions but in terms of content censorship and tracing what would be the implications on private conversations and chat like the oblig the thing there is that like nothing in the traceability provision says that it would only apply to public conversations like right? traceability in fact will apply and its biggest use case will be for private conversations because most whatsapp conversations are private conversations from people to people and sometimes like you know very small groups of of people so what like companies like whatsapp and signal have two choices either they implement traceability and by massively increasing their data collection or breaking end to end encryption and like, associating metadata of messages with users number one or to like they don't do it and then like because of that eventually either get banned by the indian government or get taken to court so like in practice i would say that that's the end game that we are moving towards who gives in first what steps we take to get there is what we have to see but unless courts step in like i think it's a matter of time before that really ends up happening yeah i think one aspect so we you know you spoke about the internet freedom foundation and their petitions and how they've sort of worked uh, towards it but um, i one question raised is how, what are the avenues for individuals and communities to advocate for freedom of speech and privacy under the it rules um how should they go about it i mean i would say that like the it rules are already law uh, and it's quite hard to change law once it's become law like um to give you an example i think like like in the last in the in the current terms of like the current government i would say there are two big laws that have been delayed uh and didn't manage to completely change um because of public opposition the first was the land acquisition act and the second was like the farmer law reforms that have temporarily been pushed out right that's the level of sort of sustained public engagement that is required to make everyone aware about the law uh, and so that people can start really thinking about it so because of that i would say like that 
public engagement on digital rights in general there are many like great avenues like the internet freedom foundation and like research organizations and entities that i've just mentioned earlier like cis in bangalore uh, like has geek as well for like some issues in terms of having a community of users who understands them that people can be a part of but i think in the specific aspect of these rules it's very hard to imagine them changing unless either something really really big happens or unless the courts step in and i know that there's slightly pessimistic view but like realistically speaking i think engaging with digital rights in general understanding the importance of privacy and security spreading its awareness in the public and making sure that people are aware as to why these things are important is much more crucial than hoping to change these rules because of like engagement because that's not really the modus operandi of like how to set up a lot in in practice there were many problematic things with the rules in their last version as well but they won't change until they were changed for the worse i think uh, one more question that was raised um, which i think you sort of answered but i just sort of want um, clarity in case you haven't is uh, a great deal of po- policy in public tech gets away without peer review and consultations so what is the scope to push for this with meti under the iit rules are there examples from international context to borrow from um you have just said that it is law right so what are the avenues considering that it's been passed and how do we work on it no i mean i think that like there's a big difference between doing a public consultation which was done on like on a older version of these rules and to like you know follow the outcomes of the the public consultation so i think that like there is there is more and more peer review and like consultation that happened for the data protection bill and for the reliability rules and i think that like why it is important to give entities an uh, avenue to like comment on them which i think that like that has started to happen more and more in india's case right so i think that what we should be asking for instead is for meaningful consultations that means if overwhelmingly people are telling you that certain things are good or bad ideas you don't just ignore them and do whatever you want to do anyway but engage with them and like improve laws and regulations because of that um like things internationally like i mean all laws in the european union go through a very extensive public consultation process but that doesn't mean all laws in the european union are good right like they they have a pretty horrendous copyright directive that is very bad for the internet and was and took years to pass and also went through lots of public consultation and peer review so i think that public consultation and peer review are important uh, and should be done so meaningfully but they shouldn't be looked at that like one key solution to like solving all problems because the prerogative and the onus of what the law should be finally and always will rest with the government the us government for example ran public consultations on net neutrality before they rolled it back in the trump administration too so uh, like there are so many examples all over the world where like even if meaningful even if consultations are done like they aren't necessarily followed and i think like once and like making sure the public consultations are followed through and lead to changes in law is an act of like public activism and and of like general public engagement that requires the understanding of these issues to significantly uh, change and improve all over the country